closely. One of the things about Trump, because he, he's very, um, he really understands how to kind of name things in a, in a very deep way. You know, he's, he's, yeah, he's, yeah. He, he studied uh, Jung. You know, it's in one of his, I think it's his third book. He's studied, Carl Jung. He started, studied Carl Jung quite a bit, and you could tell, because he kept saying, I kept saying populist, and he kept saying popularist. And I tried to kind of correct him. He said, no, 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 it's popularist. And we kind of agreed to disagree, but I could see, I could see what his, his thinking was. So I left there and I said, no way he's running for president in 2012. But uh, this guy is a very serious guy. If you ever decide to do it, um, if you ever decide to do it, um, I thought it'd be very serious. And then he did write a book. One of the things we recommended is that if you want to do this, you should get a policy book out there. And he wrote a book, the five, I think it's in 2011. And I think the subtitle of the book was Make America Great Again. Um, I t think the title was Time to Get Tough, Make America Great Again or something like that. But the book, if you ever, and uh, it's not one of the most famous of the Trump books, but it very much lays mm -hmm. out uh, what he ran on in 2000. And the title was Make America Great Again. I think, I think the title was uh, a Time to Get Tough, and I think the subtitle was like Making America Great Again. In that book had that phrase for the first time. I, I think I remember seeing it. And it's a very serious book. If people go back and, and look at the book that came out in 2011, really had a very deep understanding of kind of his thoughts on, on trade, his thoughts on America and the world, his thoughts on taxes and, and what people would be. So in 2010, I didn't believe, I came to meet with Dave and I said, I don't think this guy's running for president uh, in, in, anytime soon, but uh, I'll, uh, I definitely- You thought he had possibilities. Absolutely, I started keeping my eye on him. So I, I saw him go, Dave Bossie and others in CPAC um, would invite him to these, uh, to these speeches, these gatherings. Uh, I think the first one is maybe in 2011 at CPAC, uh, and we had Breitbart at the time. I was also doing a radio show in, uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and I started watching him. Normally when I go in to see politicians, I try to sit in the back or the side to watch the crowd, how the response is. Because most of the times I've heard the speeches before. And I noticed something on Trump, there was a couple of things. He didn't, he didn't speak like a politician, he had a Vernac he talked in a vernacular that people could relate to. And I noticed that people would lean in to his speeches. I'd seen that on uh, Sarah Palin, mm -hmm. that they had this, con they have a connection. They have a visceral connection with working class people. They have a visceral connection with the middle class. That, that goes beyond politics. And I, uh, that's one of the things I started following, telling guys, hey, I think this guy's going to be a serious guy. In fact, you've called him the best order you've seen since William Jennings Bryan. Bryan. It's a single reason I think that, and I think this is why most you know, political consultants and strategists, I, I don't really pay a lot of attention to guys on TV, et cetera, because I, I think they, by and large, have fallen into this thing of modern, you know, I came out of Harvard Business School, one of the big focuses is kind of the Procter & Gamble's marketing, and they really have marketed uh, candidates like products, right? And you can see all the tells that they have in that, and, and they try to form these guys, but they, you know, the Frank Luntz words at work, you can't say certain words, and it gets so thin, so dry, that there's no real substance there. And I think today, uh, I think it's one of the things the internet's given us is this search for authenticity, right? And tr Trump, I'm telling you, and I can't believe the, the, the media missed it. If you look on the campaign, I mean, these speeches, these crowds were barn burners, and each one had a different policy perspective in it. If you go back and look at the speeches, it really is the plan for the Trump plan. But his oratory, and it shows you how people yearn for this still, I mean, his oratory is very powerful. He is, he is the greatest speechmaker, orator. Obviously, I think in modern political history, I think it's only been one, William Jennings Bryan, who was also a populist. But you cannot do three, four, five of these rallies a day and come in fresh and, and galvanize an audience. You go back, and if you were sitting there live, it was just incredible. I mean, the entire campaign, because we didn't have a lot of money, it wasn't really a modern campaign in the fact that we didn't do a lot of TV. We didn't do, I mean, we took the modern uh, mm -hmm. of data uh, mining and targeting and all that, and couple it with an old-fashioned, you know, just let's get this guy out and get him in front of the biggest crowd as possible. But the oratory is spellbinding. I think he's a spellbinding speaker. And if you look at the audience, they're engaged. I mean, how many people wait 8, 10, 12 hours in line? We used to do a thing at the end to bring up the person who was in line first. I mean, people would be there 24 hours. But mm -hmm. then once you got inside, particularly if you're not seated and people wanted to be down in the, in the mosh pit, you know, people would stand for three, four, five hours waiting for the speech. I mean, the, just the, And that said what to you? It said we've, we've got something. I mean, one of the things we did when I first got to the campaign was to make sure we tracked Hillary Clinton very closely. 
And I noticed that, you know, not only the speeches were terrible, um, they didn't have any kind of theme, they weren't galvanizing, but we noticed that she went to Temple and started to go to these colleges, and we could tell that the kids are from the other Democratic schools around town that kind of, they're there because they're loyal Democrats and they're to see it. There was no rallying points, and we, he, he was the exact opposite. I think the speeches were, were clearly, clearly, um, you know, touching people, you know, hitting them, you know, Shaw said only connect. He was connecting very hard. The thing I noticed about his speeches is, is that he has a conversation with the audience. Yes. Well, it's call and response a lot of times. Yeah. You know, they know after a while where the, where the call is, and they're going to do the locker up, you know, drain the swamp. You CNN, approved of all that. C CNN sucks. <laughs> you agreed with all those points? Absolutely. I thought they were all terrific. They were all key. They were all key. Including locker up? Well, I, I, you know, one of the things in coming to the campaign, and that's why, you know, I don't know why people had to have meetings with other, with other countries, but I thought there was more than enough there. You know, I was the head of the uh, group with Peter Schweitzer, the great author, and you guys have had him on 60 Minutes a couple of times, of Crony Capitalism. And we took, I think, two and a half years of Peter's team of, of investigators to do Clinton Cash. Uh, and there was clearly enough, you know, there that I think you could do all types of, if you drill down further. So yeah, I think it's definitely for investigations. I'm not one to politicize stuff, but I, I think that But are you suggesting that somehow uh, she ought to be vulnerable to an indictment now? I, d I definitely think that there should be further investigations. I think the Uranium One situation alone is, is, should have a, a much deeper investigation. Mm -hmm. I think the whole Clinton Global Initiative, the whole Clinton... Uh, this is the fundraising aspect. The fun of fund they had the, both the merchant banking and the investment banking arm. I think those things ought to really be looked at uh, for Bill Clinton and herself, particularly her time as Secretary of State. And I'm not one to politicize this. I'm not saying let's go after Hillary Clinton, just to Hillary Clinton. I, one of the core tenets of the populist movement is that we, and this is one of the things I made sure we put into the speeches about her, you know, what I told President Trump at the time, this campaign can be, it's very simple. You know, she's the standard bearer for a corrupt and incompetent status quo. And you're the agent of change. You're the agent of change that Obama didn't deliver. Okay, you're an agent of change. If you, if we always have her as a foil, she's the status quo, you're the agent of change. You know, you're going to win this thing. And that, if they have to make that decision, because the math was there, you saw already, it was like two thirds uh, wrong track, right track. I think 70% of the American people thought the country was in decline, particularly economic decline. So all the underlying substrate of, a, of an electorate that wanted change, and it was a change election, was there. And if you force her to defend the status quo, if you force her to, to kind of this permanent political class that has a grip, regardless of party affiliation, has a grip on this city and has a grip on a nation, if you make her the tribune of that and do a, and do a compare and contrast, you're going to win. But isn't it sad that we're getting to a point in which people are calling for the other side to be put in jail and to be indicted? Um, you don't want to. You don't want to politicize this. I mean, well, I think that's exactly what we're well, doing. Well, no, 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 no. But, but, look, but look at look at look at look at President Trump. I mean, one of the things I, I continue to say, you talk about a, um, you know, a repudiation or a nullification of an election. I mean, look at President Trump. I mean, not only do you have an, in, a special prosecutor in the Justice Department, a couple of grand juries, you have on Capitol Hill, right, with Republican leadership. You have three separate committees. I think you have two in the Senate and, and one in the House. And they're investigating him and sending out subpoenas. And, and, and you know, they've had some big breaks already. So it, and this that's is a Republican-controlled Congress. I know, but look at that for a second. That's what I'm saying. If you look at the nullification of this election, it's one of the reasons I, I, I left the White House and, and I talked to the president about it. I think he needs air cover on this. I think if you look at, uh, if you look at this, the nullification of this election, I don't think it's coming from the left. Yeah, you have the Democratic Party and you have the, the corporatists and, and you have all this, and I kind of think there's second or third tier, as I'm sure we'll get into. But principally, the Republican leadership has allowed three committees to go and principally be run by Democrats. I think Adam Schiff's running the, the House committee. I see him on TV all the time. Looks like Mark Warner's running the, the, the Senate committee and not Senator Burr. Can you imagine? Let's just take in, the, in, the, in political physics. Can you imagine if Hillary Clinton would have won and, and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi were the heads of the Senate and the House, that you would have three committees investigating President Hillary Clinton and you would actually have Republicans running those committees? Of course you wouldn't. It's well, just, this, it's, yeah, this gets us into policy discussions about the Russian probe. Let me d defer that sure, for a second and go sure, back to the campaign. Sure. Uh, at the time that you met Donald Trump, impressed by him, Yes. I'm impressed by um, 
his curiosity, impressed by his attention. Was he at that time talking about the Bertha issue? This is 2010. Never brought it up. Never, never brought it up. up. Never brought it up. Later, later he did uh, uh, approach me and, and we talked. It was not the Bertha issue. He did approach me about uh, putting up, and I think this came out, he later did it, but, but if myself and some donors would be interested in, in matching uh, for a, uh, a um, not a fund, but a reward for like Occidental College if they turned over President Obama's college records, that there would be some sort of donation of you know $2 million or $5 million. And I think that it never came together, but I think right before the 2012, I think he actually did a video in his office where he actually said, I'll put up a million dollars if I think it was Occidental College would, would put up the, the funds. But he, I've never had any conversation with him at all. We talked about uh, the birth. In fact, on the campaign, I think it was in September, October, we actually had that session where he went to his hotel and said, you know, President Obama was born in the, uh, in the United States. But I've uh, never had any conversation. But with that him. came after a long period of making it a big public issue for him. You know, Breitbart, Andrew Breitbart, uh, was very famous, and our site was very famous, of, of not being a birther site. In fact, the first time, at the first Tea Party convention in 2009, I think it was, 2009 or 2010, early 2010, where Sarah Palin uh, kicked it off in Nashville, Tennessee, the opening night was my film, uh, Generation Zero, and Andrew introduced it. And uh, he and Joe Farah actually got into a tussle later where, where uh, one of the Washington Post reporters got it because Joe Farah had gotten up and given a thing uh, he had actually started, I think, with the Gospel of Matthew, went through all the, you know, all the lineage of Jesus, and then he said, you know, even Jesus Christ needed a birth certificate, and, uh, and the place went crazy. Andrew and him got in it later. So we were not, our site was not birthers, we were not birthers, but I've never heard, I never heard. So birthing birthers. was not an issue for you and something you believed in? You, no, you, I thought, you I thought, I got, look, the, the paper and everything in Hawaii, it just, it, it boggled the imagination that it could happen. By the way, but I know people that ran around and you know, were talking about social security numbers and it was a big item for a while, but it was never, my issue is President Obama was never where he was born. My, pre, my issue is President Obama were his policies, not, not where he was born. But I never heard President Trump ever mention that one time. How did you get involved in the campaign? Well, you know, I had spent, in, uh, I never spent much personal time with Trump. Even at CPAC, when he would have a suite, it would be my, like my sister would go up there as per, people of the company. So I never, I probably didn't spend 15 minutes in the interim years. Uh, with Donald Trump personally. You know, he came on my radio show and now he's on the pages of Breitbart. It was in, um, if I go back really to 2013 or in January, in fact, at this very table, uh, I had a meeting with um, Jeff Sessions and his young aide de camp, Stephen Miller. And uh, this was right after the 2012 defeat. And we had a, a dinner and we laid out um, the RNC was coming out with the autopsy report which said that you had to, you know, had to go to something like Gang of Eight, Amnesty, all this. It became the kind of the lexicon of the Republican Party. And uh, I had read an analysis in Real Clear Politics by Sean Trendy that talked about how working class people had not come out and voted for Mitt Romney. And that would have made the difference that they had. And so I started doing just some analysis about what a working class movement and this populist movement, what it could really do in a general election. Had a dinner with Jeff Sessions, who was kind of the agrarian populist that was really the, the spiritual head of this movement. And I talked about two things. I said, look, trade is number 100 on the list of issues. Nobody ever talks about it. And immigration is like two or three. But if we ran a campaign that really focused on the economic issues in this country and really got people to understand how trade is so important and immigration are inextricably linked uh, about the suppression of wages for the working class and really pulling down the middle class, you know, we could really set this thing on fire. And I said, look, you, you're not going to win the primary and you're not going to be president of the United States, but it's a way for us to use this as a vehicle to get it into the general conversation. And Senator Sessions said, I agree 100 percent. I'm not the guy, but I agree with you. But that, that person will ar arrive. And so I started really... And then he became the early supporter of he, Donald he, Trump. He, intellectually, always. I mean, because it was just intellectually, you could tell this, this movement that was going on. Remember, he had the huge battle in 2013 for immigration, which was really the civil war of the Republican Party. It was the Gang of Eight, and I think it was in June or July, finally got voted down, uh, I believe, in the House. And it was just, uh, it was really tore the party apart, I think, a lot. The following year, Eric Cantor, as the majority leader, first time in American history, got defeated in a primary by a guy who raised $200,000, Dave Bratt, on the issue of immigration and these trade deals. Um, and so we could see this was going to get traction. I was following Trump 
at the time of the other candidates at these small forums. And you can see that Trump was starting to talk about these issues, particularly talk about trade with China, talking about NAFTA, talking about the bad trade deals. People, I could see the applause. I could see, because no other Republican would talk like this. They were all free trade guys, right? And he would talk about immigration. He would talk about what we had to do with illegal immigration. But he didn't just talk about it. I mean, he talked about it in the most graphic terms, calling people who were coming from Mexico rapists. That was, that was when he made the announcement. That's when he made the announcement. I think if you go back and look at these other speeches he was making, he was making it in a, he was making a, a case of a policy case, right? And he was doing it with his, remember, he speaks in, he does not speak like a politician. He speaks in a very plain spoken vernacular. Here's the thing I took away from it. It resonated with people like you couldn't believe. No other Republicans were talking about this. Remember, they, they, have a, they had a standard doctrine of free trade uh, and, and kind of limited government. And, uh, and I'm not saying all that's wrong. Free trade, obviously, I don't agree with. But it was just not resonating. And then in, uh, in 15 led to, 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 to early 16, or to 14 led to 15. And you can see when Trump announced, you know, because I think he was like fifth or sixth in the polls when he announced, because nobody thought he was serious. And he announced it was galvanizing. And of course, the media bit right away on the comments about, uh, about illegal immigration and blew it, I think, blew it up to the thing that it galvanized everybody to focus on exactly what he was talking about. And then from then on, and it was interesting that. But well, you were not part of the team by then. No, we were running Breitbart, but I could tell, I could tell this was something. So look, we're, we're, a, we're like a throwback to the, the newspapers in the 19th century. You know, we have very set. Uh, beliefs at, at, our, at, our, uh, at our, our media operation. You know, we're populists, we're economic nationalists. Uh, we don't, we believe in America first. We don't believe in a lot of foreign intervention that's not in the uh, vital national security interests of the United States. So Trump was really, and we had others, you know, Huckabee, and there were other populists out there. Ted Cruz had a, had a huge following for a while. But uh, we noticed, like, even in the first debate, and we kind of had a classic battle with Fox News in the very first debate when Megyn Kelly jumped Trump, you know, with his Twitter feed and what had been on the Facebook page or whether it was in The Apprentice, you know, we had kind of a break with Fox. We could tell that Fox was trying to run interference for the traditional Republican candidates, whether that was Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio or these more traditional candidates, and they were trying to go after Trump. So how did you become the CEO of the campaign? What happened is that, uh, you know, after the, um, after the, the convention and then after the uh, President uh, or Hillary Clinton's uh, convention. It was in mid-August. There was an article about by Maggie Haberman on a Saturday morning uh, in the New York Times that really talked about how his campaign was in disarray. It was falling apart. Uh, the campaign guys didn't think they could talk to him. He was very unhappy, etc. And so, um, you know, I did some checkings. I got the paper, Saturday paper, at seven in the morning. I'm sitting at Bryant Park, reading my paper, drinking my coffee at seven. And this thing looked a lot worse because we weren't intimately involved in the Trump campaign. We were following it. And we knew the numbers were looking bad. You know, you had the Khan situation, you had the Judge Curiel situation. And I started calling around looking at the numbers and guys are saying, look, it's 12 to 16 points down and it, this is looking bad. And the Republican establishment that weekend, you know, was looking to say, hey, we're going to cut this guy loose. This guy's going down and we got to save the House. We have to save the Senate. I talked to... Uh, Two of the, I talked to a couple of the investors in, in Breitbart, uh, Bob and Rebecca Mercer, and you know, talked to them about it. And as Rebecca and I talked, we basically said, um, you know, we knew Kellyanne Conway very well. She had run the super PAC mm. for the Mercers for Ted Cruz. She was now a pollster. And the Mercers had been supporting Ted Cruz. Had uh, to $25, 30 yeah, million right. dollars. And, but by the way, they had come over and were huge Trump people. They, were, they had actually met, I think Rebecca had met with Ivanka and Jared back in June and just wanted to say, hey, we're going to put in the same, you know, we're going to put in some serious money into a super PAC. We really support him. And we talked and said, uh, and he talked and he said, what do you think? I said, look, this guy can win. There's no doubt in my mind, 100% certainty. If it just stays on this populist economic message that got him through the primaries. So the unspoken deal was that you could show him how to win as a populist. But the deal for you was that you would get an opportunity to see a populist agenda enacted from the White House. That deal was never, no, it's never a, it was really, a, it was really, hey, you are a populist, you're an economic nationalist, you, you have these beliefs, because they're Donald Trump's beliefs. All we have to do is You didn't have to convince that. him to no, be a populist. No, 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 no. His default position, by the way, if you go back into the primary the entire time, these are all coming up. He talks about this all the time. It just hadn't really been, in fact, in the, in the uh, acceptance speech at the convention, you see a very powerful, I call it the Wittenberg 
cathedral speech. I thought he not nailed, you know, the, the speech was looked at as being artless. I thought the exact opposite. I thought it was like a jackhammer. He was Be because because it was he just, hit all the points that you he, wanted to hit. It was just powerful. He was just hitting populism, immigration, was, trade, trade, the basic core, and it was relentless. And in fact, I remember attacking the establishment, attacking the establishment. And, and I was watching CNN afterwards because I was doing the radio show. And I was watching CNN, and they were all saying the worst acceptance speech ever. It didn't show unity. Didn't have that uplifting rhetoric of bonding America. And then I think they went to a panel, and you know the panel was like seventy percent. We loved it. It really got to us. He told us what he was going to do. So you could see if he could pierce that show. And that was the whole thing with it. Look, when Trump says he's his own strategist, he is his own strategist to agree. He's, he's, a, guy, uh, he's a guy that really knows the world. And so it, this was just very simple. It was just to make sure we took away all the other nonsense away from the, from, from the campaign and just focused on his core message, which he had. By the way, it's something he's talked about for 30 or 40 years. It's to, it's to the core of his being. All we had to do, and he had won in the primaries, is just set up a system to, to, put, to, to basically compare and contrast himself with Hillary Clinton. She's the standard bearer of a corrupt and incompetent status quo. Okay, I'm the agent of change. I'm the agent of change you thought you'd gotten Obama, but you didn't. What did he expect from you, and what did you expect from him? I think he just expected him as just he was going to be just the, the candidate he could be. But did you see him as a guy who could give voice to this economic nationalism? Yes, he could. That we you saw had that. believed in. Yes, absolutely. We saw that from the beginning. I mean, that's why the site itself, a year and a half, when he came down, you know, Breitbart said they used to call it started going Trump art. But we finally saw an individual, a, 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 somebody in the political arena that could articulate and particularly touch the American working class people within this vernacular and actually get a response out of it. And did you bring him a certain constituency that he might not have reached? Because in the primaries, no doubt. I mean, he had a guy named Sam Nunberg that worked for him for years. But Sam Nunberg was the guy that had the Facebook controversy in the summer of 16 that was let go. Nunberg had been very close to us for a long period of time. And he made sure Trump saw the Breitbart. So the Breitbart audience at that time was this kind of populist economic nationalist, but had tremendous amount of limited government concerns. But You've been attacked for what was on Breitbart because uh, people looking for ways to characterize you look at the things that are on Breitbart. So it's total, it's total nonsense. Let's talk about that for a second. You know, we put up 250 to 400 pieces of, of, of material a day. I've got sites in Jerusalem. I've got sites in London. We have video sites a day. And they pick a handful of satirical, satirical uh, uh, headlines to pick it up. Let's talk about the one they, they say, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bill Crystal, renegade Jew, right? right? That's, that's a story written by, it's a headline picked by, one of the most prominent conservative Jewish writers in our country, David Horowitz. He wrote a two-part series. And he was calling um, Bill Crystal a renegade Jew because of not supporting the state of Israel enough. This is what the left throws up. I mean, to say that we're the most pro-Israel site, the most pro-Israel site in this country is Breitbart. The, the, the most anti-BDS site in this country is Breitbart. The one that has the protection of young Jewish kids on college campuses is Breitbart. The one that's done more articles on the plight of the Jews of Europe is Breitbart. And so when they say anti-Semitic, the reason I don't attack them, by the way, I'm giving one of the keynote addresses to the Zionist uh, Organization of America in the fall, introducing Sheldon Adelson, being introduced by the, uh, so by, by, by the, by, by, by the uh, ambassador from Israel, Ron Dermer. Right. The reason I don't, the reason I've never defended myself against any of this, or even Breitbart, is when the left is in that cul-de-sac of identity politics, we're winning. What's the? What's you the, believe that if, in fact, somebody's talking about racial identity and identity politics rather than economic issues, they lose. Let me give you the perfect example. 100%. Here's the example. When when I was announced on Monday or Tuesday after that Saturday and Sunday with Trump, the the, the mainstream media and the left go, Trump is down 16. We know he's heading to 20. The Clinton campaign knows it's over for him. Okay, he knows it's over for him. He brought in a bomb thrower. And he brought in this guy, Bannon. What's this guy, Bannon, going to do? Bannon's going to wreak havoc on all his enemies on the way down. This is Trump's, it's all going to be vengeance, right? And what you saw was the exact opposite. A highly disciplined, focused campaign on going to certain areas we knew we had to go to with that message every day of populist and national. In the industrial Middle West. Yes, industrial Midwest, but also in North Carolina. One thing, about a week later, Hillary Clinton, who had been with all her fat cats in the Hamptons and Silicon Valley doing nothing but raising money, right, the entire time, she comes out to give her first speech since I was announced. 
So I go into the, the war room we had with TVs all over and all my young team there. You know, Jason Miller, Andy Sarabian, Stephen Chung were sitting there on every TV and they got, she comes out and she goes, it's, it's the Breitbart, Bannon, white supremacist, alt-right speech. And I sat there right then and told the crowd, I said, we got her. If that's where she's going to go, we got her. She's done. We're 15 points down. And right there I said, she's reconfirmed to me. She has no earthly idea what she's doing. She has no earthly idea where this country is. Trump's message and Trump, we can beat her. And I thought at the time we could actually beat her big. Maybe not 300 electoral votes, but I said we can beat her. She, she, they, they walked into a trap. America does not think it's a racist country. People don't. You saw in Houston. This is the greatest country in, in, in man's history of how we pull together. People don't think they're racist. And she's sitting up there with identity politics at the time when the elites in this country have, have had an economic hate crime. You want to talk about hate crimes? Economic hate crime on the working class people in this country. That's a hate crime. How the industrial base in this country has been eviscerated in the elites, the ascended economy of Silicon Valley, Wall Street, Hollywood, and Washington, D.C. And she's got the gall to sit up there and talk about that. That's exact. Her whole defeat was summarized in that first day she came back. Her whole defeat. And we knew it. And that's why we just drove. So were we you not surprised? Um, were you By the way, I love it. When they go to identity politics, I said this the other day. The, and, and Schumer and these guys, the smart guys, the populists, on their side, they had that conference a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago. They, they came out and they said, we know, we, the, 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 the conference I think was three or four weeks ago, it came out with, I think, the better deal. And they said at the Chuck time, Schumer. Chuck Schumer, and the guys around here, I think one of his top guys, of course, said, hey, Bannon's the guy who gets economic populism. He came out, the whole thing, they said, we're not talking about identity politics, we're not talking about race, we're talking about economics. And we deconstructed that thing, and Trump's already got programs for all of it. So they, they're trying to go after the core Trump program because they understand. Bernie Sanders understands, Sherrod Brown understands, Tim Ryan understands, Seth Moulton understands, Tulsi Gabbard understands, that that's what can win in this country. Would when those people on, have beaten Donald Trump, you think? I think if Sherrod Brown had been one of the, the size of relief I had, it was when Sherrod Brown was not picked as her running mate, um, we would have still won. And we would still if won. if Sherrod Brown running. had been the candidate in 2000? In 2016. 16, you would have lost. I don't think we were lost. You would we not did. have been able to pick up that audience. I think we, I think we were still, no. Trump would have still won because he still comes encumbered. He still comes encumbered with a lot of the social stuff. I think in, in 20, I think if Sherrod Brown had been the VP, is what I'm trying to say, instead of Tim Kaine, it would have been much harder. Um, Trump has made the point that when you talk about the contribution of T. Bannon, that he'd already won uh, a number of primaries. Uh, how do you measure your contribution to this campaign? Um, it was a total team effort. You know, Jared Kushner was really my partner at, at the top level. We had Kelly and Conway. We brought in, you know, first call I made was to Reince Priebus to get the RNC up there, Katie Walsh, Sean Spicer, hired Dave Bossy to run with Katie Walsh day to day. So it was a huge team effort. Jason Miller comes. We had a fabulous team. Contribution, I think, was just kind of pulling the team together and saying, hey, because I was from day one, we have a 100% chance of winning this. What I used to tell the guys at Breitbart before I left, Napoleon told his marshals one time, when you set out to take Vienna, take Vienna. And they did. And that's what the philosophy What is was. it about you and fascination with military biography and military leaders? I come from a, you know, Norfolk, Virginia and Richmond. You know, Norfolk's a Navy town. We were a, a Navy family and a blue-collar working-class family around the base. And Richmond, as you know, coming from the South, it's imbued with, with history of the Revolution and the Civil War, all the great contributions from World War II. So it's just a thing as a kid. You know, I knew I was going to be a, I knew I was going to go in the military. I went to military prep school. My kid brother's a Navy yeah, pilot. Yeah, but you're so beyond so that. When you go look at your library, you see a lot of books yeah. about military stories, a lot of books about biography. I mean, it is the library of someone who is enormously curious about history. Well, yeah, because I think if you, if you want to make an impact in the world, you have to understand both institutions and I think the flow of history. And one of the ways to do that is through the lives of great men and women, uh, particularly the struggles. And what you find when you study it is that every one of them that became great over time or beloved over time had insurmountable obstacles in front of them and how the, what they had to do to overcome those. And that's why I picked up from history and also the cycles of history, that certain times, you know, like the Bible says, there's going to be certain times of unity and there's going to be certain times of disruption. And, and in those cycles of history, you have to know 
I think, and I think the study of history allows you to see that. I, I, one of the greatest advantages I think I have, even in this town, is that from a very early age, you know, like nine to ten years old, I started reading serious history. My mother, you know, got serious history books for me, and it's amazing. In your in whether it's Wall Street or even in Washington, which is pretty shocking, is people really don't have a deep understanding of history, and particularly the flows of history and the rhythms of history. The Donald Trump. Donald Trump has an intuitive, intuitive uh, sense of people in moments. You know, people say, "Hey, is Donald Trump smart?" Is Donald, not only is he smart, he went to Wharton, I went to Harvard, so I'm more on the poet side of MBAs. He's more in the mathematical because Wharton's really yes. known as the finance school. Um, He's got something very unique about smarts, and that is applied intelligence in situations of immense pressure. You know, he always says, I don't choke. That he's, a, he's a money player. And, and, and you've, I've seen him on so many situations where the pressure's been on, and he's had to think through a situation and deliver. Okay, let me bring you to Billy Bush. How did both of those things, that analysis, apply to Billy Bush? Take us inside the dilemma that he faced. Well, he, when, he first, when we first got the tape on Friday afternoon from, I think it was the Washington Post, uh, he and I came to the same conclusion, and Jared and other people, that, look, this was locker room talk. This was two guys on a, a bus or a dressing room years and years and years ago. Uh, this is not the guy that, that people know, and people know Donald Trump. So we dismissed that out of hand of any of this over the top. And we thought the reaction would be so over the top from the mainstream media and from the left. And so that night we did a little video, right, to kind of explain his situation. And then the next day, what happened, particularly in the morning, was that a number of of people started to drop off the campaign. People started saying, you know, they, they, they weren't going to support Donald Governor Trump. Governor Christie? Well, that, that, that came later. I think it, it, what happened is that we had a meeting up at Trump Tower, and, you know, Reince came and other, some other people, advisors were there. And, uh, you know, Reince, who's a fa fantastic guy, but I think really at that time was representing where the donors in the Republican Party were. He was incredibly upset. Reince had been with us the day before he came back. And, and Trump went around the room and asked people what the percentages he thought of, of still winning and what the recommendation. And Reince started off and Reince said, you have, uh, you have two choices. You either drop out right now or you'll lose by the biggest slant slide in American political history. And Trump, with his humor, goes, that's a great way, that's a great way to start our, start our conversation. We went around the room and you could tell, I could tell from the incoming of politicians and I could tell from some of the politicians that were there is that the natural inclination of politicians are, are, are to be so overwhelmingly um, uh, stunned and shocked by how the media comes on you. But Trump wasn't that. And I told him as he went around, I was the last guy to speak, and I said, it's 100%. You have 100% probability of winning. And that's the first time. But you time. seem to have done that at every point in the campaign. When he was in trouble, asking him to double down on his rhetoric, double down in terms of appealing to his base. Appearing, appealing to the American people and to the working class people in this country, absolutely. You know why? Because it was a winner. That's why I told him, double down every time. And on that day, that's the first time and only time we ever got upset with him. He goes, come on, it's not 100%. I go, it's absolutely 100%. And I told him why. They don't care. They don't care about they don't your, care they about, don't care your rhetoric. They, well, about, the American people don't care about how you talk about they, women that way. They, they don't care about locker room talk when the average American, I think 50% of Americans have $400 in their pocket. Charlie, you've been out in the Midwest in this country. You've seen your own home state of North Carolina has been gutted with manufacturing jobs, the furniture industry, the apparel industry. Of course industry. they care no, about that. No, Everybody that, knows they no, care about they, that, and they, they care about that deeply, and, way, and it's a primary way, concern, because, way, because if you can't take care of your family, then you're in huge problem. Not just not In terms of your own self-respect and in terms exactly. of the dignity of your work. Exactly. And that's why J.D. Vance... But they do care about values, and they do care about respect for women. They, they do. do. They and do, know but, but they know that. And it's not just locker room talk. That's locker room talk. The Billy Bush thing is locker room talk. By the way, we have we have a but you agree we have empirical people, evidence to prove this. He got he got forty four percent of the female vote. He did you lose 40, confidence of anybody because they came at you at that point and said, "Look, we, we, he ought to get out of this race," other than Ryan Priebus? Billy oh. Bush Saturday to me is a litmus test. It's a litmus test, and I said it the other day to General Kelly during the Charlottesville thing. Afterwards, it's a, it's a line I remember from the movie The Wild Bunch. William Holden uses it right before that huge gunfight at the end. When you side with a man, you side with him, okay? The good and the bad. You can criticize him behind, but when you side with him, you have to side with him. And that's what Billy Bush weekend showed me. Billy Bush Saturday showed me who really had Donald Trump's back to play to his better angels. All you had to do and what he did was go out and continue to talk to the American people. And we have empirical evidence that I'm correct and you're not. And here's what it is. 
Not only did he win, he got 44% of, Ameri- of the female vote. People didn't care. They knew Donald Trump was just doing locker room talk with a guy, and they dismissed it. It had no lasting impact on the campaign. Yet, if you see the mainstream media that day, it was literally he was falling into Dante's Inferno. And I realized that two things. Number one, traditional politicians will run for the hills. Trump's not a traditional con- People don't understand something. The mainstream media and the Democratic Party were not trying to defeat Donald Trump. They were trying to destroy Donald Trump. They were trying to destroy him and what he stood for, okay? And they went about it in a no-holds way. They tried to destroy him. People do not understand the courage this man has and the will this man has. There was no reason. You know why he ran? You know why he ran? People said, oh, he's this. He ran for duty for his country. He's a billionaire. He's got an incredible wife. He's got an incredible family. He's got a great business. He's got every star in the world coming to him. He's got probably, if you look at the material life, the most perfect life you have. Why would you give that up to go out and be destroyed? Can I list for you about a thousand billionaires who would do the same thing Absolutely if they not. thought? Absolutely oh, not. The, I can to tell do, you. A thousand billionaires all who, have the, if they all thought have that, the if fantasy. If they thought that they could get the presidency, would go it's for it. It's not get the presidency. You have to know what you're going to go through to get it. That's it's a different question. It's a, right. No, and, but and that many is of them, the question. He knew at the beginning when he came down that escalator. Look at what happened the next day after he came down the escalator. They went to destroy him that next day. It's the it, reason Are you trying up. to destroy someone when you simply describe what they have They're said? They're not describing what he said. If, if you, you look describe at what, said, what it was well, much if more If you run the tape, which is a news item, that's no, not no, trying to no, destroy no, no, somebody. No, 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 that's no, simply Charlie, trying Charlie, to report. Tra- Charlie, give me a break. If you look at the, go, let's go back and look at the, uh, and look at the social media and the Twitter accounts of all the young reporters following Trump on the campaign, of how they were coordinating with each other, how they were, they were the opposition party. That day on CNN and MSNBC, that's not just reporting the news. That has panel after panel after panel in an onslaught. And we knew that. And we knew that we could, and we, and here's the way to defeat it. You know what he did? He was advised, oh, go in 60 minutes. You know, have your wife and your daughter sitting on the couch. You know, apologize, do all this, do that, go on TV that night. He went down, and when we actually were in the room, he says, no, I'm going to go down. He took the elevator down. I think there were 10,000 people in the streets. He went down, Secret Service went crazy, and he went outside and talked to his, and talked to his followers. And we went back on the campaign that following. You know, we had the, we had the, uh, the Sunday night, we had the, uh, we had the uh, debate in, 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 in St. Louis. The famous debate where we brought the women, the Clinton accusers. That was your deal? A hundred percent. You wanted to do that for a while? A hundred percent. Why? Because I thought if you're going to go after Donald Trump for his, for his words, let's have the Clintons defend Clinton's actions. Those women wanted to confront Clinton for the longest period of time. And yes, I was very, prepared, been looking to, for an I opportunity. Was very prepared to give them the opportunity. And boy, we had one in that debate because we had, we had the trap set. And they walked into it only at the last second. Did the, uh, the debate the, organizers? Debate organizers. We almost had a fist fight, and it, it, it was pulled between you and whom? Well, it was fair. It was really our lawyer, uh, Don McGann at the time, and I think Ferencoff and uh, and McCurdy or whoever the guy is. It was, it was the because what they had allowed to happen with Mark Cuban at the other debate, they had promised us that Mark Cuban wasn't going to be in the line uh, the uh, line of sight. That Cuban was going to be four or five rows back because Cuban had made a big deal. I'm gonna get in Trump's head. And at the very last second, they put him right down there. And I went to those guys and I said, because Rudy and I had cut the deal beforehand, I said, how was this? And they said, well, we can't control it. We don't have security control. It. We know a yeah. guy can do what he wants to do. So when we tried to pull the same thing, and I had the women, the accusers, sitting right in that VIP box. Bill Clinton had to walk right past them, right past them on national TV to start the debate. And guess what? They were going to confront him. What does this say about Steve Bannon? He's a good counterpuncher. I'm a fighter. I'm a street fighter. Okay? I'm a street fighter. And if I'm in a fight, I'm going to win. And Donald Trump's a street fighter. And you'll do whatever is necessary to win. Inside the bounds of decency. Is that not inside the bounds of decency? To allow the accusers of Bill Clinton, these women, to actually have a shot to confront him? Is that outside the bounds? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it's something that's needed to be done for a long time. The Clintons are so high and mighty, and they accuse Donald Trump, and their campaign specifically, they had not gone after, and the mainstream media and the left had not gone after to try to destroy Donald Trump particularly for something like language, okay, then it would have been different. But no, they want to play like that, they're going to have, they're going to, have to, will, 
we'll, we will ratchet up the stakes. They're the guys that did the Cuban situation. That was the whole thing to get in Trump's head. Okay, so you want to be Cuban thing. Mark, yeah, I said, right. you want to be cute on Mark Cuban? I'll see you and I'll raise you one. I want to move to a transition. I want to move to the government. By but the way, we rattled her. You could tell. She was rattled. We know from her campaign, she was, and he was rattled. But we got didn't, to him. didn't she win by all the debates? No, absolutely not. No way. Who won the debates? The first debate, and our strategy in the first debate was to mitigate our downside risk on policy. I think Trump, I think it was even. I think it was a draw. All right, so even okay. the first, the second debate. So we won, hands down, not a question. St. Louis, the, the, the town hall, we won, hands down. I don't think it's any question. I think he fully dominated, dominated the space. Her new book actually says, the, the, I wish I had confronted him more. She actually says in her book, she wished she had gotten, you know, he was in her space, she wanted to get there. I think in that question and answer, yeah. I think it was spectacular. Third, I think it was a draw to us up, up slightly. But remember, the debates were where she was going to show. We, we divided the campaign into three sections. The first was from mid-August until the first debate. We're 16 down. More importantly, we're only 70 on the generic ballot, which basically generic ballots are Republican ballot. You have to be at 90. Nine out of every 10 registered Republicans have to vote for you. I think Trump was at 70 because a lot of Republicans saying he's not a Republican, he's not my guy. That time from mid-August until the morning of the first debate, we closed. And on Morning Joe, that Monday morning, I think it was the Bloomberg uh, pollster. And I think Joshua Green came out and said we were inside the margin error of being up one or two. We had closed the entire gap. The second part of the campaign was the three weeks of the debates. But remember, in the three weeks of the debate, and we planned on it, she was supposed to crush Donald Trump because she was a policy wonk. She knew this. She was a much you experienced You think Comey made a difference? The Comey part, irrelevant. Totally, really? Totally irrelevant. 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 Maybe she, reinforce a little bit her corruption, but it was irrelevant. The emails. It was Clinton cash, and I think the... The, 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 the greed and the venality of the Clintons that, that were much bigger and the, the negative side. That's what we always focus on. That's what I say. You don't need these meetings, these meetings these guys took. You don't need meetings. You had all the information you needed. The Comey thing, I think, was background noise. Total. Complete. Did, the, we, never, we never, on the campaign, we never focused on it. America didn't care about the emails. They didn't care enough. They didn't care as much as I cared. You know why the emails are important? The emails are important because of Clinton cash. The emails show you they're smart. Those emails are the personal emails that show all the, all the coordination with the yeah. speeches and all the, all the favors that done. Remember, when she went, into the, when she went into, the, uh, into the Secretary of State, who were the people that didn't trust her? Obama, who you can say a lot about Obama, and I do, but he's, he's an incorruptible guy as far as cr standard political corruption of cash. Okay, the Obama guys and John Kerry on the on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. What did they make her do? They made her have that agreement that before Bill Clinton or you guys do anything you think, you're going to notify us first and get our permission. Right. She had to sign a document that said that that wasn't the right. That was Obama. And that was John Kerry as a sine qua non of her confirmation. And by the way, after she signed it, she never gave him anything. The thirty three thousand emails has all the Clinton cash stuff in it. So I would love to see the 33,000 emails. But was essential? No, it's not essential, because you can make the case how corrupt they are without them. OK, we've established the campaign. Were you surprised you won? I said it was 100 percent. In fact. No, I know you said that. No, but no, were no, you surprised? I tell was you how Donald I, Trump surprised on the day that the election the third, that he won? The third phase of the campaign was a three and a half week sprint to the finish, OK, doing it every day. He could see the momentum, momentum picking up. He was an absolute believer we were going well, to she win. She believed she had the momentum. It's, that shows you how clueless they were. You know, you see, they, they had the momentum until the last time that, that Comey came out because of complete winners, nonsense. Complete because nonsense. of the winner complete, issue. Complete and then when Comey came out and it's made the announcement about you're that, you're not looking at that, the data. That turned you look, and, you and, look and halted at the, their campaign. You look yeah. at the, but hang on. You look at the data in these places like Youngstown, Ohio, and these other places where you could see that this working class base was coming back to us. The guy Jake Sullivan is the one voice in their campaign. If you read the books, Jake Sullivan sitting there going, hey, I see where Bannon and Kushner is putting this guy. I see the speeches. Look where they're going. Who told me that also was Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban said, hey, I, I, he, Cuban says, I kept telling him, you got to get to Western Pennsylvania. You got to get Obama out there more. You got to get Obama to places where he won big. You're not using him. You got to get more. And he said the weekend beforehand, he knew they were in trouble. He gets a phone call and says, what are you doing Saturday? He goes, what do you mean? He says, can you come to Pittsburgh and open for her? We need a big crowd. And she has a tough time drawing crowds because she doesn't excite people. She has no message. He went to Pittsburgh and he said, I knew they were in trouble. I knew they were in trouble in Western Pennsylvania. So don't give me Comey and don't give me a thing. We knew the momentum was on our side closing now. I'll tell you how much I thought it was going to, we thought we were going to win. 
Roger Ailes calls me up uh, like a week or two before or something like that. And it was all this thing in the press every day, Trump TV, because Trump's going to lose by 10 points. It's over. And this whole scam. So Ro just, Roger calls just, you up and says, says you're going to lose? No, he says, hey, can you come to Palm Beach or come to his house, you know, the week after, you know, the weekend after the thing. And I go, what are you talking about? He says, well, this Trump TV thing, you know, we ought to kick around. Do we have some alternatives? And I'm prepared to even walk away from the last year of my non-compete if we can put something together. And I go, because I, I, Roger, you know, Ailes was kind of my mentor. And I go, what are you talking about? He goes, well, come on down. I said, hey, we're winning. <laughs> we're going to be putting a government together. And he said. So well, Roger wanted to talk about the future in which I think after he Donald he, Trump he lost and build a new right. media. Right. Empire and he believed, and, and build and he, a new media empire. Uh, yes, right. Yes, and against he, and, Fox. And, against absolutely against Fox. That's, That's what he wanted to do. Absolutely. One more. He had one more. One more round in the in the barrel. There's no doubt. Roger Roger Ailes was incredibly uh, aggressive about thinking about the future. Even when he died, he was he was he was planning on. What did he comeback. contribute to the campaign? Uh, he had come and. Um, just uh, given us some ideas uh, on the debate prep. He came and gave right. us all the stuff that he had, you know, he had, I think he had prepped Bush. Yeah. And I think he Bush very, 41. Bush 41. His yes. media advisor. Yes. And he, he, he told us about, and he, I think he did a great job with President Trump, uh, candidate Trump at the time, of talking about the difference between a town hall and the, and the different types of debates and how you have to answer domestic issues. He was great. I mean, he's a, a well of knowledge, but he believed the Fox polling. He thought we were going to lose by a couple of three points. And I said, no way. We're winning this thing. So t Donald Trump was not surprised. I wasn't surprised. Jared Kushner was not surprised. We, in fact, on the, on the evening when we got the, we got the, uh, po the initial uh, exit polls, right. they were so terrible and so off of what we had thought. I mean, it getting crushed, losing everywhere. And even Ohio and Iowa, the two we thought we had bagged. I mean, dead even. And I'm sitting there. Everybody told me, don't believe the polls. And Jared's sitting there. And, and Jared, uh, and Jared uh, it calls uh, Drudge on the phone and Drudge chooses me out and I could hear Drudge saying, he said, don't believe corporate media. These people are totally incompetent. They don't know what they're this doing. This is Drudge telling Jared? Jared, because we, we had seen the numbers. Drudge is telling this to Jared. Jared, don't, don't believe the exit polls. And they were terrible. Oh, I see. The exit polls had us getting blown out. That's when you see the coverage in the media that day, after I think it was six o'clock or five o'clock when the first set of polls, exit polls came out, everybody's playing for an early night. They were all planning for this thing to be over by nine o'clock. You know, she was gonna make her big acceptance speech. All that you could see the entire tenor. Uh, it reaffirmed to these guys that Trump was going to lose and probably lose in a landslide. And I never wavered from the hundred percent. But I'm looking at the numbers, and you know, Jared. And what I was the conversation Jared, between you and Trump it on was election Jared, night? Jared, Jared, well, Jared called Trump right. There, called the president right then, and the president said, "Let's see how it turns out. We don't know. Those are early numbers. So we said, hey, we'll hunker down, and then we just went back into the data room. So we Donald had. Trump had no doubt on election day that he was winning this election." He might have had some reservations. Yeah. He might have had some reservations, but I think he felt he had left it all on the field, and in leaving the field, and particularly the, the particularly the culmination of that to see those crowds. And by the way, people waiting uh, at one time in Virginia to like two o'clock in the morning. They've been there since six o'clock. We were so late. They've been there like eight o'clock. You see the enthusiasm of those crowds. You see the intensity of this. You see the polls tightening. He definitely believed he was going to win. We continue now with part two of my conversation with Steve Bannon, the former White House chief strategist and current executive chairman of Breitbart News. Portions of this conversation first aired Sunday on 60 Minutes and then for the hour on this program last night. Tonight, we talk about the transition and governing, plus the Trump agenda. I begin with the definition of populism. Populism is anti-elitism. It's anti uh, crony capitalism. It is basically the voice of the people in this country saying that we uh, that there is a corrupt permanent political class in Washington D.C. inextricably linked to the financiers on Wall Street and the the, the tech uh, the, the high tech community in Silicon Valley and in Hollywood uh, that rule us and that rule us despite what, what we want to happen. Have committed uh, basically like I say an economic hate crime and in, in standing aside and seeing the industrial base the manufacturing base of this country be exported overseas. To see a rising middle class in Asia at the, uh, at the expense of the working class people in this country. And so populism is basically, it's, it's, it's anti-elite. It's anti I mean, what this movement has really, and what Donald Trump was able to galvanize is kind of what I call Jacksonian populism, which is always very, very con concerned about an elite in Washington, D.C. with kind of Hamiltonian economic nationalism. The two great forces of the 19th century politics have really been combined into kind of this modern movement. Uh, very, we're very anti-elite. And the reason is the elites are incompetent. 
If they were so smart, we, we'd be in a better situation. They're completely and totally incompetent. Brexit and 2016 are inextricably linked, right? And that's why I started Breitbart London in 2013, early 2013, 2014, because I saw this guy, Nigel Farage, in this party that you kept, that was a populist party, an anti-establishment party. And I said, that's a canary in a mine shaft. We have to get a group there that sets up and covers that every day like Breitbart covers politics here. Because by following UKIP, we're going to understand the evolution of the yeah, Tea okay. Party. But what about Le Pen in France? Lost. Well, let's talk about that for a second. There's no doubt, I think, when you look around the world right now, that the two waves, the waves that are going is populism and nationalism. Okay? Now, the, the question before us, I think, in the United States and, and, and in Europe, is it going to be a left-wing, more socialist populism? Or is it going to be a center-right or right-wing populism? Now, Le Pen is culturally a right-winger, but, but economically, she's for state control. I mean, she's virtually a socialist. She, she, she has a very garbled message. It's not very clear at all. It's tough to galvanize people because she's all for state control, for the state to take back over certain industries. It's very different than a center-right coalition. What we have here in the States, right, you have in the United States now, where you see over there, Jeremy Corbyn. It, right now, Jeremy Corbyn versus the Tories with UKIP kind of right. hanging around as a third party. So that, that type of populism this anti-elite populism that you see in Sherrod Brown, you see in Bernie Sanders, you see in the Bernie Sanders voters. By the way, in key districts, you know, 15 to 16 percent of Sanders voters voted for Trump. Voted for Trump. Because they're economic nationalists and they want us out of... Well, they were voting for change. For change. By the way, this is, it, let me just talk about the three basic components that we sold in the campaign is what the movement's about. Number one, he's going to stop mass illegal immigration and cut back dramatically legal immigration. Number two, he's going to bring manufacturing jobs back to the United States. And number three, he's going to get us out of these pointless foreign wars. That's the three basic touchstones of the Trump movement and Trumpism. There's all kind of stuff underneath there, you know, building the wall and all sorts of stuff underneath. But that's the three broad categories. If you go back to the speeches, you can see that time and again. Stephen Miller would, would put that in the speeches. And that's really the change that, that people want. You know, two wit, you know, J.D. Vance was over here. And he said, Steve, you know, it's amazing. I just read a study. I think it's a Harvard professor that shows that there's a direct correlation between the factories that have moved to China and the manufacturing jobs and the opioid addiction, opioid crisis down to like the congressional district. So you can see that there's a, there's a correlation of this. And, and, and people know that. They understand that bringing back these manufacturing okay. jobs are very important. And Trump, and Trump articulated that. So you win the election. Uh, you go through a transition. A lot of people thought might join the cabinet, didn't. Rudy, Newt. Christy. Can I talk about one, the one important thing at the beginning of the transition? So the next morning after we win, uh, Trump makes a very, uh, there's a very important decision made. And that is um, we put a coalition together to win. Reince Priebus, the RNC, the establishment. Now, Paul Ryan and people kind of came in and out as, as there were heated moments in the campaign. In fact, Ryan was on the last weekend of the campaign, waved us off coming to Wisconsin because he said, look, you guys are down three or so points. You're not going to win. It'll be a waste of time. And so we went to Minnesota instead, which we only lost by one. But in the 48 hours after we won, there's a fundamental decision that was made. You might call it the original sin of the administration if you, if, for some of the people on the right. But there was definitely, a, and you saw it that night in this acceptance speech when Reince was brought out and, and given the VIP treatment, we embraced the establishment. I mean, we totally embraced the establishment. I think in President Trump's mind, or President like Trump's mind, and in Jared's mind, in the family's mind, I actually agreed with the decision. Because you had to stand for government. And, and, and to be brutally frank, you know, the, the, the campaign, look, I've never been on a campaign in my entire life, right? You know, I'm a, I'm a, a former investment banker as a media guy running a, a, a little website. Um, we were, our whole campaign was a little bit the island of misfit toys. So he looks around, and I'm wearing my combat jacket, I haven't shaved, I got, you know, my hair's down to here. And he says, he's, he's thinking, hey, I've got to put together a government. I've got to really staff out something. I need to embrace the establishment. And, and we did, because we had kind of won in a coalition. And so the whole thing with Obamacare. I need to govern. I need to govern. And by doing that, I need to govern. I need to govern. Uh, I need to govern. I need establishment people that are going to help with my Trump So people. if he'd chosen Romney as Secretary of State, they'd have been all right with you. I was the one that recommended Romney come in for, 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 to, be, uh, to interview with Secretary of State. You know why? Because during the 2012 campaign, when Mitt Romney had the most traction, he was the biggest hawk on China. I wanted him to at least have a shot to come in. 
because we were looking at a broad range of people. We looked at General Kelly for Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. We looked at a number of David even Democrats. Petraeus. David Petraeus, even Admiral Stavridis came right. in and talked for DNI and for Secretary of State. Uh, we looked at a wide range of people. Why not get Mitt Romney in? Let the president at least see people, let him do his own due diligence. I think as it went on, people had reservations about loyalty and about would he be a team player, et cetera. But at first, particularly given his uh, angle of attack on China, I thought it was very smart. Rex Tillerson came in because he was recommended by Bob Gates. Yes, it, actually Tillerson was recommended by other people for energy. We didn't think he'd be interested. Bob Gates recommended him in the room and Rex came up. Rex Tillerson comes from one of the biggest establishment companies in the world, Exxon Mobil. He is a guy from Texas, though. He's a Texan. So, so he gets a no, pass because he's from Texas? No, 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 but he had, he had very, he, he and the president, the president-elect spent a lot of time with each other. They had a very similar out, outlook in the world on the Middle East, on Russia, maybe not so much in China, because right. Rex really went to China, but the Middle East and Russia, we thought were going to be two very big hot areas. Okay. They, they were but all of a sudden, you're running against Washington, and you're, and you're running against the establishment, and the people you're choosing to come in. Some are establishment, some are very anti-establishment. Okay. But let's talk about bringing in establishment figures. You have, to, you have to stand for government, right? Maybe you get people the second tier and the third tier, but you've got to coach these people up. There's not a tremendous amount of anti-establishment folks that are prepared to step in and be Secretary of State. I mean, we talked about Rudy about it at length, and the decision was made that it was not going to be Rudy. I mean, Rudy is one of the guys I Why was... Why was that made? What was the decision? Rudy went and did six shows on Billy Bush Sunday. He was the only person that went. Even people on the campaign would not go out there. Rudy went out there. To me, that's... Rudy is a guy that's always going to have your back. On Billy Bush Sunday, he went on all six morning well, shows. Well, you took names on Billy Bush Sunday, didn't you? I did. Uh, I got him. I got it. You know, I'm Irish. I got, I got my black book and I got him. I'll never, it's indelibly. If you weren't there for me on Billy Bush Sunday, then I won't be there for you when your ambition comes up. I'll always know that when a guy like Trump runs to the gunfire, you're going to be back in the foxhole. May have to use you. By the way, Reince and I became great partners, and I, and I really love the guy. And, and Reince, and by the way, it wasn't just Reince personally. He's, he's a tough guy, but it was the donors. But Billy Bush, and by the way, Rudy was there. The president made a decision, okay? And Donald Trump's a, good, a great guy at weighing and measuring people. He loved Rudy, but he made a decision for what we needed at the time, that Rudy just wasn't going to be the Secretary of State that he, Donald Trump, felt he needed, okay? And so, by the way, you we know really... What? He didn't look like a Secretary of State, and that mattered to Donald Trump. You know it did. I think President Trump, it's just not the, uh, the, 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 the intelligence and the, and, the, and the aspect of it. It's definitely how you bring, how you comport yourself physically, right? So, so, but by the way, it wasn't Rudy. You've heard him look. say this. That's why I'm telling you. The um, and that's why you're smiling. The um, Rudy, we spent a lot of time with Rudy on being Attorney General, and a lot of time with Rudy being Department. He of only Homeland wanted Security. to be Secretary of State. Only Secretary of State. He was very. I spent one time. I spent five hours on a Saturday with Rudy on both Attorney General and, uh, and DHS, and it just, you know, he was very adamant. He just, it was either state or nothing. And Newt? Newt came in really, Newt could have had a pick of things too, and Newt was very upfront at the time. I've got more to do for you guys on the outside uh, than being inside. He never, he came to us right away and said, I, I don't want to be inside. He could have, Newt could have had his pick of, of, of what he wanted also. Sessions, Newt, Rudy, the guys that really been there the entire time. They Gen General, General Flynn, General Flynn. Those guys could have had, and that's why General Flynn was selected. You know, Jared came to me right afterwards, and, and, and we talked, and General Flynn was, the president wanted General Flynn right out of the box, so General Flynn was selected right away. The people, General Kellogg, General Flynn, Rudy, Gen, uh, Secretary, uh, Attorney General Sessions, uh, et cetera. Christie, because of uh, Billy Bush uh, weekend, uh, and uh, was, uh, was uh, not looked at for a cabinet position. He wasn't there for you on Billy Bush weekend, so therefore he doesn't get a cabinet position. I told him the plane leaves at 11 o'clock in the morning. If you're on the plane, you're on the team. Didn't make the plane. That was on Saturday. I told him. Plane leaves at 11. Those who are on the team are going to be on the plane. We're going to St. Louis. Rudy was there. Rudy was on the plane. Governor Christie wasn't. All that nonsense about Jared Kushner firing him and everything like that is, couldn't be farther from the truth. I, I've never heard Jared say anything negative about uh, Governor Christie. In fact, everything I've heard Jared ever say about Governor Christie has always been positive. So th that whole nonsense the media plays up is Jared Kushner put the knife in it. It was, it was purely 
on performance. I, I like Governor Christie a lot. He, he's got tremendous attributes. And he added, by the way, on the last debate, he was the guy that, that prepped. He prepped. He, he came back and worked. But it was Billy Bush weekend that's always stuck in my mind. January 20th, you take office. What did you want the president to do in that inaugural speech? Okay, so it's not what Stephen Miller and I want to do. Th that speech, I'm telling you, Donald Trump worked on that speech down at Mar-a-Lago. He had a very, and that speech is a very populist and very economic national speech. It was a forceful speech. I believe it's as forceful in a more, a, a way of more refined rhetoric than his acceptance speech at the, at the convention. But it's a powerful speech. What we, try to, what we try to do in structure. Nobody had heard an inaugural speech like that, ever. I know. That's why I think it's so powerful. It laid out really what Trump had won and what Trump was going to do. We took a little bit of uh, the structure of Lincoln's uh, second inaugural, in which he builds to a climax, and then war came. He goes through all the things that led to the Civil War, and then he hit that very powerful line, then war came. That's where we structured it as President Trump yeah. was writing things. And then now arrives the hour of action. He builds the case for all the talk. A call to arms. Call to arms. That's what that speech was. Absolutely, 100%. He worked in that speech more than any speech he's ever worked okay. on. One, one iteration after another on the American carnage line. My, the only thing I said at the time, I just wish, Stephen and I the night before, because it was going to rain, we spent virtually into the wee hours of the night making sure that the teleprompters work and there were cases over for the rain. So we're out there in that beautiful setting on a, on a, on a chilly night while it's, while it's drizzling and, uh, and, uh, and getting ready for it. And I told Stephen at the time, I said, if only we could turn the podium backwards and face the permanent political class. It's really the speech. We shouldn't give the speech out to the people. They know what he's going to say. We should turn it around. So it's facing the Capitol. Facing the Capitol and facing the permanent yeah. political class, because you're, you're ba basically like an Old Testament prophet. You're, giving, you're laying out the bill of indictment against them and how you're the agent of change, and now you're here and it's a new sheriff in town. That thing was very powerful. Let's talk about the new sheriff and what he wanted to do. What was the highest priority for this president? The highest priority, first off, was get the economy going. It was the economy, immigration, but let's talk about that, economic nationalism. We can see now in August of what he did with, with enforcement of the, of the immigration laws and his whole uh, effort to talk about how he's going to put up tariffs, how he's going to put up quotas, how it's going to be a new day in America. You must invest in this country, right? We're bringing manufacturing jobs back. We're in, we're in early September, right? Economic growth at 3%. We have no tax cut. And in fact, if you read the press, we don't even know if we're going to get a tax cut. They're still thinking about tax reform, tax cut. That's all in the future. He has 3% economic growth today. Okay. He has lowest Hispanic unemployment in 11 years, lowest black unemployment in, in 16 years, lo lowest overall unemployment in 17 years. Wages in agriculture, particularly at the lowest level, wages in construction at the lowest level are on the rise. We're seeing wage increases. You know what that is? That's economic nationalism. It's controlling illegal immigration, and it's letting the world know that if you want to be in business, you have to come to the United States. Business investment's up 10 percent, business confidence 20 percent. This is Donald America Trump's... America was built on the... America was in the eyes of so many people, uh, and it's what people respect America for. It is people have been able to come here, find a place, contribute to the economy. That's what immigration has been in America. And you seem to want to turn it around you and could, stop it. You could be more dead wrong. America was built on her citizens. It began. America was built on her citizens. We're all immigrants. America was built on her citizens. Except the Native don't, Americans don't, 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 don't give me, this is the thing of the left. This is, right. Charlie, that's beneath you. Right. America's built on our, on our citizens. Look at the 19th century. What built America is called the American system. From Hamilton to Polk to Henry Clay to Lincoln to the Roosevelts. A system of protection of our manufacturing, financial system that lends to manufacturers, okay, and a control of our borders. The American system. Now, it's not that we're not anti-immigration. In fact, no. Donald Trump works with Tom Cotton and Governor per and Senator Perdue to come up with the RAISE Act that shows you that what we want is an immigration system that benefits America, an immigration system that's merit-based, that can, that, can, uh, that can assist yeah. and help America in its industry. It's not that we're anti-immigration at all. We're for citizens of the country, R regardless of your race, your ethnicity, your religion, your sexual preference, okay? The people who have been eviscerated 
by unlimited economic, uh, illegal immigration have been Hispanic and black working class in this country. This was the power of what Trump did in his campaign and what we talked about sessions at this very table. Trade and illegal immigration are the same, are two sides of the same coin crushing the worker. The trade deals just bring the, 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 the power of cheap international labor from its point of origin. Illegal immigration is just bringing that foreign labor to the United States. It's both crushing pressure on the working class in this country. And by the way, that's, that's irrefutable. Bernie Sanders, back in the old days, was the biggest guy about stopping illegal immigration. So were the labor unions. That's why the rank and file votes for Donald Trump so overwhelmingly. It's, it's, it's quite simple what the problem is. And so, and so, by the way, that's what we support. The RAISE Act, but I tell you what we don't support, H-1B visas. You talk about, we, in this country, you have the, the grammar schools. Everything's on a STEM program, science, technology, engineering, and math. We've done away with history. We've done away with art. We've done away with culture because all the kids have to be STEM kids. But they can't get into the engineering schools, and they can't get jobs in Silicon Valley. Yet Silicon Valley consistently wants to bring in foreign labor from Asia to compete with them unfairly. Why is that? We're not going to solve the problem in this country until yeah. we have black and Hispanic kids in Silicon Valley and in the engineering schools. We have hundreds of thousands of kids from out the world, India and China, hang on, okay, in our right. engineering and, schools, and we, in our computer science schools, and you're not going to solve that until you open these things up to American citizens. People, American have, come here, American people citizen. have come here and made huge contributions uh, to our economy, to our technology, to our science. And you don't want them to stay? I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I said, yeah. if you look at Cotton's Raise Act, we have to do this. First off, should we have 1.1, 1.2 million immigrants every year? How did that number get picked? We've done that every year since 1964 when it was passed. How's that number pulled out of the hat? We have no earthy idea. What we want is a merit-based system so that those people that can contribute in a meaningful way can still come here, always be able to come here, okay? But we have citizens in this country that have to be taken care of. And that's the promise of Donald Trump. I'm looking out for you as a citizen, okay? You're an American citizen, whether you're Hispanic, whether you're black, whether you're, whether you're Jewish, whether you're evangelical Christian, whatever your sexual preference is, you're an American citizen. And guess what? I will defend your right to the job okay. first. Let's go down the list of what things that Donald Trump wanted. He wanted to do away with Obamacare, repeal and replace. It didn't happen. Dad talked about the original sin of this administration. The very first meetings we had with the Republican establishment, here was the plan that was laid out. They would take Obamacare. It's a three-part program. They would take Obamacare, the repeal and replace. We would take the taxes, would be phase two, the tax reform. And then we would take also infrastructure, would be phase three. And people say, why don't you start with infrastructure first? Right. Well, Because you could get some Democrats involved. But infrastructure is quite complex, particularly the way, by the way, you so have you to have to postpone that to 1918, uh, 2018. Well, no, 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 no. Let me tell you the worst thing. No, it's worse than that. The plan was to do Obamacare because, remember, Paul Ryan and these guys come in and said, we've done this for seven years. We've voted on this 50 times. We understand this issue better than anybody. We know how to repeal and we know how to replace. And this is ours. That's where we're going to start with day one, and we will have something on your desk by Easter. By the Easter break, we'll do repeal and replace. Come back from Easter and all the way up to the August break, taxes. Come back from, from, from the summer break on Labor Day, and we drive home to the end of the year on infrastructure. We accomplish all three big legislative goals in the first year. They would take... This is what the leadership in the House and Senate told you. And we agreed to... That was the deal. They, but, but so you're saying I'm blaming them for all of this. I'm not blaming this. I'm not blaming this for all this. What I'm what I'm saying is that, as a statement of fact, that they were going to take repeal and replace Obamacare, and they're the first to admit. They're the first to admit that there's wide dissension inside the Republican caucus. There's wide dissension. They couldn't even repeal it when left to even repeal it in, in June when, in the Senate. They put up for a vote. They only had 41 votes. There is wide discrepancy in the Republican Party as we know today. Now that we're in it, but I will tell you, leadership didn't know that at the time. They didn't know it to the very end. And let me tell you about Obamacare. There's something that's being worked on right now by Lindsey Graham and Cassie, which is and Rick Santorum, which is really modeled on the 1996 welfare reform, where it devolves it back to the states. That is probably the highest probability we have, and probably the one last shot we have to fix Obamacare. Have we Obamacare. come to that where the choice is simply to fix Obamacare? I think the choice is going to be you're not going to be able to totally repeal it. 
I think the taxes will stay in place. I think some of the other things will stay in place. I don't believe that there's an alternative now, at least on this alternative that Rick Santorum and them are working on, that you get a full repeal of Obamacare. You, you're still going to have some of the architecture. And by the way, you're still going to have, at least right now, the taxes in it. And I think that's mm -hmm. just a reality. And by the way, that was not thought of by the Republican establishment. Remember, they told us, we have done this for seven years. This has been our number one issue against Obama, is Obamacare. In fact, we have Tom Price. He's going to be your, he should be your secretary of, of HHS because he's the intellectual leader in this effort. And so that whole effort, and as we saw as we got into it, you see from the debate, you could see from what was happening every day that the Republicans themselves did not have uh, their hands around this issue. Travel Adam. It's now looked as um, your baby. What happened? What do you mean, what happened? I think the travel ban is very successful. I think the Supreme Court's going to uphold the key parts of it in the fall. And I think Could it have been drafted better? In fact, President Trump likes the original draft. You've got to remember something on this. Everybody says, oh, it just shoved out in the middle of the night. To go through an interagency process, you have to have an executive order. And by the way, the mainstream media knows this. You have to have the Office of Legal Counsel over the Department of Justice sign off on it. We had this thing, interagency process. We had already started in the transition period. We had two EOs. The other one was the enforcement EO that came underneath it, right? The one about the enforcement of the deportations. These EOs were fully vetted. And by the way, General Kelly has said on public testimony, they were fully on board to do it. Were there a couple of wrinkles? Yeah, there were a couple of wrinkles. But you know what he found out? It's about extreme vetting, OK? It's about extreme vetting. And we have found out we didn't know a whole lot about how you actually vet people coming to this country. I think the travel ban has been enormously successful, and the key parts of it will be upheld in the Supreme Court. It is said, or you at least have said, when you saw the number of people uh, lining up at the airports uh, being detained because they couldn't get in because of the travel ban on the first day, that you said that was a very successful optic. I did not say that. I said something quite different. Not about the people. And by the way, that was administrative confusion. And for the people coming in, clearly, uh, you, you don't want people that, that you know, should have come in to, be, to be, uh, have anything that d would delay their trip. What I thought was a good optic was the resistance. The resistance. The resistance started that weekend. The resistance is going to keep the House of Representatives in Republican hands. The resistance was so over the top, right, so insane. So the resistance is what, on, on Joe Scarborough every morning, what they talk about, like in Georgia. They say, hey, if you had a chamber of commerce, church-going, little league coach, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneur running in these things against Republicans, they'd win by 20 points. Yeah, well, they would, okay? Or they, they would be very competitive. Guess what? They're not going to be Democratic candidates. And you know why? The resistance. The best you're going to get is, was it Asse, Asaf down in Georgia? That's the best you're going to get. Because the resistance... He lost. He did lose, but that's the best you're going to get. The resistance is going to force people in primaries to the left. So what occurred, which we didn't even think of, was the resistance. And you see the resistance is so outside the American mainstream, okay? They are so over the top. They will drive the Democratic Party exactly where they, 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 they shouldn't go, which is they should go more to the middle. They should go to more economic nationalism and populism. And the resistance will stop that. And that's why you're not going to have competitive, can competitive candidates. You believe the Democrats are talking about simply being anti-Trump rather than being uh, pro-economic. The smart ones, the Tim Ryans, the Sherrod Browns, mm -hmm. uh, you can see it out there. They're, they're, they're talking about the economic issues that could be a platform Democrats win. But most of the Democrats are so, this, remember, it goes back to the trying to destroy Trump. Trump has, uh, President Trump triggers, triggers the left, and they can't handle it rationally, okay? And so as long as they can't handle it rationally, they're not going to defeat him. Why is he at 30-some percent approval rating? I think he's at 30, I think it's 36 or 38 percent because he hasn't, uh, we haven't gotten the wall built, we haven't done, if you just go through and just do the Trump program that he laid out and just punch those things out, you're going to do fine. You're going to beat your 47 percent. I mean, you've got, you ripped through from Paris, there's now talk you may not, uh, try to undo the Iran nuclear deal. Decertify? Right. I wouldn't bet on that. But, but there is you know, talk about that. Definitely talk. The, the, the apparatus wants him to continue to certify. President Trump wants to, wants to get the deal and, 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 and either go make a better deal 
or just, uh, or just uh, you know, view it from the outside. Have you cleaned the swamp? Well, first off, okay, the swamp is 50 years in the making. Let's talk about the swamp. The swamp is a, is a business model. It's a successful business model. It's, it's a donor, consultant, uh, K Street lobbyist, politician. Seven of the nine biggest, most wealthiest counties in America ring Washington, D.C. For the first time in history, the per capita income in those counties is higher than Silicon Valley. What are you Valley. talking about when you talk about the swamp? You're the talking about the lobbyists the and the people. The permanent political class is represented by both parties. Okay? This is not, people still think in a left right continuum, a Republican and Democrat continuum. While you continue to think that way, you're not seeing what the real story is. The real story is economic nationalism and populism on the left and the right versus a permanent political class of which Hillary Clinton represented. That swamp, you're not going to drain that in eight months. You're not going to drain it in two terms. This is going to take 10, 15, 20 years of relentlessly going after it. So now, Trump in his first eight months has, has done, I think, amazingly. He's forced his, the people who work for him. You can't lobby. So you your can't. takeaway on the Trump administration so far is what? is that it's, a, it's, it's um, hammering through what it's trying to hammer through to deliver on the promises that President Trump made to the American people when he campaigned. And if he just continues to go down that path and punch out those promises he made, he's going to win. We're going to win in 18 where we'll pick up six or seven Senate seats. I think we'll pick up a couple of seats in the House and he'll win in a huge landslide in 20. So if he does 2018 that. is going to be a big year for you? 2018. You're not worried about losing the House? You're not worried about losing the Senate? I'm worried about losing the House now because of, this, uh, because of DACA, and I'll tell you why. Da DACA, this whole situation with DACA over the last 24, 48 hours, which I think has to be sorted out, the whole issue of amnesty was put to bed in 2013 uh, in, uh, in, in the great civil war that occurred in that summer in the Republican Party. The predicate of Donald Trump's winning of the nomination was that issue of amnesty. Remember, when he beat 16 people, that was the creme de la creme of a generation of Republican politicians. You had Chris Christie and Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz and Rand Paul and Jeb Bush. I mean, this was the best of the best. I think it's the best field that's ever been, and Trump beat him. One of the reasons he beat him, he was so different on immigration and trade, but particularly on immigration. Right? And, and, and there was very few that were there. And by the way, so that got, to me, absolutely sealed it. Amnesty is non-negotiable in the Republican Party. The Gang of Eight and Marco Rubio, Marco Rubio made a bet. He made a bet. The New York Times reported it. That dinner that he had with, I think, Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes, Schumer, in uh, January 2013, same time that uh, Sessions and I met here, they had the thing about rolling, okay. take, taking the autopsy and then taking the autopsy and building Gang of Eight, and they would roll it out into the summer of 2013. Marco Rubio made a bet that that would make him president of the United States, and it was, he was wrong. Amnesty has been non-negotiable in the Republican Party. And my fear is that with this six months downrange, if we have another huge, if this goes all the way down to its logical conclusion in February and March, it will be a civil war inside the Republican Party that will be every bit as vitriolic as 2013. And to me, doing that in the springboard of primary season for 2018 is extremely unwise. This is extremely unwise. You have the ability right now to pick up five or six seats in the, in, the, in the Senate in red states. You have the ability, I think, to hold the House and maybe even pick up a couple. Because right now, by the way, guys are down, those, those, state, those districts that, that, that uh, Republican congressmen won that Hillary Clinton won, if you look on the generic ballot, they're down 10 points. I admit that. But once you put the candidate up, once you put the resistance candidate up, and that's what you're going to get, the resistance is going to give you not the Little League coach and not the